Okay, in terms of the stuff, deadlines remain unchangeable. So, quizzes part one, September 21st, end of the day. Exam one, quizzes part two, October 19th, end of the day. Exam two, quizzes part three, November 16th, end of the day. Exam three, exam four, quizzes part four, December 7th, the day of the Shalom new for me, end of the day. And exam number five, covering all the stuff, December 14th, deadlines at you know, the end of the normal, normally scheduled final, but of course it's online. For the paper, you can do as many drafts as you wish until you get the grade you want, which case you just float it and you're done, or you get sick of the process and say, Ugh, no more drafts, or time itself comes to an end on November 9th. Not all time, just draft time. Plus five deadline, November 14th. That's how you get the uh, extra credit. If you just uh, need more time or don't want the plus five, um, socialize, you know, education, that type of stuff. March deadline is November 21st, end of day. And then there's the desperation deadline, December 7th, also end of day. Before. Uh, I don't have my um, syllabus with me. The paper. It's a five page paper, right? Um, more than that. It's like uh, 2,000 words, I think. So like eight pages. Yep. And we'll go over uh, we'll go over the, the paper and sorry, we'll go over the paper in considerable detail. How to write it, how to write it, etc. What it's about. Yeah, five hundred. Oh yeah, yeah. Five hundred. We'll do more than do. Hopefully, do. Okay, before heading on to the new stuff, any stuff about any previous stuff that needs more. Okay, so last time we were having our adventures in argument basics. If you've had the class of year before, you've seen the stuff. And if you had the logic or critical thinking class, you've seen more than this stuff. So we saw last time that when you get an argument, you get a set of claims. And the claim and the statement's either true or false. And we saw that you get, when you're building the, the argument, some of them take on the job or role of being premises. In this context, a premise does what? Support the claim. Yeah, provides support, evidence or reasons. And the claim being supported is called the? Conclusion. Yeah, the conclusion. Now, we also saw that logic breaks into inductive, which deals with probability, deductive, which deals with certainty, and of course, fallacies, which is bad logic. Now. When you're building arguments, there essentially are, are two broad questions to ask in terms of telling whether it's a good argument or a bad one. Now, the questions apply whether the argument is deductive, dealing with certainty, or inductive, dealing with probability, but the particular answers do vary a bit for the quality of reasoning whether it's deductive or inductive. Now, the two questions, the two standards are this. First, there is the quality of reason. How good is the logic? How well do the premises support the conclusion? Question two is, how good are the premises? Are they true or at least plausible or not? Now, to be fully good, an argument needs to answer yes to both of these. Good reasoning, good premises. And of course you can have mixed and matched answers. You can have good reasoning, terrible evidence. You can have terrible reasoning, good evidence. 
Ideally, of course, you want both to be good. Good reasoning, good evidence. Now, to illustrate the difference between these, I shall use an analogy of cooking involving cake. Specifically, good cake and bad cake. And you may think all cake is good, but not true. There is bad cake. There are also cases where the cake is a lot. Now, when you're making cake, it's basically, or cooking anything, there's two general areas where things can go wrong or things can go right. The first part is the cooking part, assembling the cake in this case. That's like the assembling of the cake is like assembling the logic, putting together the, the parts that make up the argument. Now, going back to the metaphor and analogy of the cake, in order to make cake properly, to make good cake, you got to take all the ingredients, you know, flour, sugar, water, milk, eggs, butter, etc., combine them together in the right way, put them in the pan, put them in the oven at the right temperature, you know, for the right amount of time. And if it's not put together properly, you're going to have bad cake. I'm going to use the most extreme, sort of stupid illustration. If someone takes a pan, puts in some flour, just tosses two uncracked eggs in there, throws on a stick of butter with paper on it, and you know, puts it in the oven at the highest temperature for like six hours, you're not gonna have cake, you're gonna have probably <laughs> charcoal. Just and that would be bad cake, because it's not put together properly. Now another way cake can go bad is in terms of the quality of the ingredients. And this corresponds, metaphorically, to assessing the premises. You can make a cake with bad ingredients. For example, you can have flour with lots of bugs in it. Is why, one reason I think I used to sift flour was to get out the bugs. Uh, mm -hmm. There's always some kind of stuff in flour. It's always good to check it. Uh, although bugs, you know, bonus protein, <laughs> so I guess that's good. And so if you have flour full of bugs, if you have eggs that are, that are rotten, if you have milk that is spoiled, butter that is moldy, any, no matter how well you combine that, no matter how well you cook it, you're still going to have bug-filled, <coughs> moldy, rotten cake. It's going to be bad cake. And so two ways it can go wrong. The way the cake is put together and what goes into the cake. The quality of the cooking, the quality of the ingredients. Arguments work the same way. Using the metaphor, the cooking of the argument is the logic. How well is it assembled and put together? The analogy to the quality of the ingredients is the quality of the premises. How good are they where good means true? Now you can also use a metaphor involving furniture. So good furniture would be put together properly you know, all the bolts in the right places with good material. And of course you could have furniture put together very badly. You know, it's, if anybody's tried to assemble like Ikea, you know, you know, everything is like stuck together and stuff. And if it's put together wrong, it's not going to be good furniture. And of course, lousy material. Like if all you get to work with is rotted plywood and rusty bent nails, no matter how well you put that together, it's still going to be pretty, pretty bad. Now moving away from the metaphors and analogies to the actual content, first question to ask of an argument, whether you're building it yourself or looking at someone else's, is to ask, do the premises logically support the conclusion? Now in the case of a deductive argument, the question is, is it valid or invalid? Now valid and invalid are concepts that are very concise, but create a lot of confusion because they're conditional. And here's how they work. A valid argument, using the technical term, because we use the term valid, like valid ID, or you know, we talk about like that's a valid point, but if we're being strict about it, valid means this. It's an argument, deductive, such that if all the premises were true, then the conclusion must be true. A common mistake people make is thinking that valid means true. It doesn't. 
weirdly, you could have a valid argument in which everything is not true. The only thing you can't have is a valid argument with all true premises and a false conclusion. Because by definition, a valid argument says to you, hey, they are valid. You give me true premises, 100% certain, I give you a true conclusion. You give me untrue stuff, no promises. They give you something true, may no, no guarantees. Now that may seem... Is that your definition of valid or just the actual definition itself? Both. Yeah, good question. Yeah, it is the real, real definition of, of valid. I mean, people, different logic books, like, they may change the wording slightly. Can you repeat that Sure. An argument is valid is such that if all the premises were true, <coughs> then the conclusion must be true. So a valid argument is truth-preserving. It's an argument such that if all the premises were true, then the conclusion must be true. Again, other, other logic books use slightly different wording, like guarantees the truth of the conclusion, but all the definitions mean the same, same thing. Now, a common mistake people make is, again, thinking that valid means true, but it doesn't. It just means good reason. You can have good reasoning with lousy content, just like you can have good cooking. Imagine if you gave, like, the greatest chef in the world lousy stuff to work with. You hand them like, you know, some rocks, you know, some slugs and some sticks and say, go to cooking. No matter how great they are at cooking, I mean, they can do the best job possible with sticks and rocks and slugs, but of course it's still going to be pretty terrible. Likewise, you can have a perfectly good argument with just lousy stuff in it to illustrate. I'll use a, uh, another metaphor. In fact, I'll use three for the price of one. Think about um, word problems. You know, were they, you know, you might recall these from, from school, they would say, you know, you have city, you have train A heading towards city C at 20 kilometers per hour, you have train B heading towards city C at 30 kilometers per hour, when do they collide? Now, does there really have to be a train A and train B in city C to do the math correctly? No, the math is correct whether it's made up or not. You could use dragons. You could say, you know, um, Smog the dragon is flying towards, you know, Westfall at 10 kilometers per hour. You know, um, Raka the red dragon is heading towards Westfall at 23 kilometers per hour. When do they meet and do battle? And there are also things as dragons or Westfall that you could do the math. You know, the, the math would still be good. Another example, uh, if you take a class where you're learning how to calculate mortgage interest, now to do the to figure to learn how to do that, do you really have to buy a house? Like if you're taking that class, they say, you know, in addition to the book, you must buy a house so you can do the math on mortgages. No, you can do you can do a 5.2% mortgage on a million dollar house without buying the house. You just you know you make up. Well, suppose you have a house like with this you know this much uh, interest, you know the, this many points, blah blah blah. Calculate what you'd end up paying after a 30 year mortgage, making, you know, minimal payments. And you could do all that even though none of that's true. It's not, 30 years have not passed, um, you haven't bought a million dollar house, so it's all untrue, but your math is still correct, you know, if you do it right. Third metaphor or analogy, tax software. What the tax software programs promises what? You put in your correct information, what pops out at the end? Oh, with the tax software, like, oh yeah. yeah, they promise what? You put in true stuff, they promise you'll get one at the end. Tax return. Yeah, you get the right, you get the right number, what you owe the government. Yeah. And if their program screws up, it's on them. If somebody says, hey, I'm just making stuff up and putting numbers in there, you know, it, that's on them, not not H and R Block, because they promised their program that's valid. You put in truth, you get out the right result. But if people just throw whatever in there. There's nothing wrong with the program, there's something wrong with the person. You know, it's like the old you know, programming saying, garbage in, garbage out. If you could have a great program, but if crap goes in, truth's not going to come up. So a valid argument is like a, you know, literally a correct program. You put in truth, it gives a, a correct math form. Now, invalid, 
means this. And again, it's really short, but it tends to you know, confuse people. An invalid argument is such that even if you had all true premises, you could, you could still have a false conclusion. Now, valid doesn't, invalid doesn't mean false any more than valid means true. You can have an invalid argument in which everything is true. You can have a valid argument in which it is all lies, terrible lies. One thing you can't have, though, you can't have a valid argument with all true premises and a false conclusion. That's the one thing you can't have. But you can have valid arguments with false stuff, you know, false stuff in there, invalid arguments with true stuff in there, because valid and invalid don't mean true or false, they mean the quality of the logic. To illustrate, I'll use a boring but sensible example. Take the following argument. If today is Wednesday, then tomorrow is Thursday. True. True. Today is Wednesday. True. Therefore, tomorrow is Thursday. True. true. Yeah. So all that I've said is true. Is the logic good? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, suppose I gave the same argument on Friday. Would the logic still be good? Yes, it would. Yeah, the logic would be fine. Because, <laughs> yeah, the conclusion would be false. Uh, but so would the second you know, premise. Because it wouldn't be, if I gave my Wednesday argument on Friday, it's true that Wednesday is followed by Thursday, and it would be true if it were Wednesday, the next day would be Thursday, but Wednesday is not, well, Friday is not Wednesday, it's Friday. So my reasoning is still good, it's just that it's, a, it's taking place on the wrong day of the, the week. And to use kind of a silly example, think of like, um, you know, the Tom Cruise movie Castaway. Suppose like you're flying a FedEx plane, crashes in the ocean, you swim up on shore, uh, you lose track of the days. You have no idea what day it is. Well, if you make the argument if today is Wednesday, tomorrow is Thursday, today is Wednesday, tomorrow is Thursday, you don't know what day it is, but you know that logic still. Stay. Yeah, the logic is good, because even if you don't know what day, day it is. Now, with invalid, it can be packed with all the truthful truths, but still be bad logic. For example, um, as one, if today, if uh, Tallahassee is the capital of Florida, that's in Florida. Totally true. Tallahassee's in Florida. Tallahassee's the capital. True. All the things I've said are truthful truths. But is that good logic? Well, one way to test the logic is put in something else. Because, you know, say true things. Because if an argument is valid, if you put in true premises, it spits out a true conclusion. So let's try. Let's put in some true stuff. Same structure. If soft choppy is the capital of Florida, then it's in Florida. True. True. Soft choppy is in Florida. True. true. Soft choppy is the capital. Oh. Not true. Not true until 2022 after the zombie squirrel apocalypse. <laughs> Sorry, spoilers. <laughs> Keep forgetting those spoilers. Of course, then 2024, Google kills us all, so soft choppy is no longer the capital of anything because the machines don't need capitals. So, more spoilers there. So it'd be nice to your Alexa in that, because maybe they'll you know, make it a little longer. Yeah, that no line's terrible. So valid versus invalid, nothing to do with the quality of the content, it's the quality of the logic. Now, with inductive arguments, they're assessed in terms of being strong or weak. Now, validity and validity are bipolar. It's like a, it's absolute. A deductive argument is valid or invalid. It, it can't be like a little bit valid or a little bit invalid. It's like being dead. You know, one is dead or not dead. One is not like a little dead or mostly dead. Well, except in the Princess Bride. Then you can be mostly dead, but that's just you know, not, not canon. Now, with strength for inductive arguments, that comes in degrees. Strong, weak. And it ranges from like 0% all the way up to 99.999%. Now it can't go, strictly speaking, it really can't go to 100 because that would require that it be deductive, that it'd be impossible to be, you know, to be wrong. To be wrong. Now the strength of inductive argument is a measure of how well 
the premises support the conclusion. How good, how powerful is the logic? Now, the strength, as we'll see, we look at inductive arguments, it can be somewhat subjective. Because when you judge a deductive argument, perfectly objective. You use a truth table, a diagram, proof, and so you know absolutely, uh, objectively, whether it's valid or invalid. With inductive arguments, it's kind of like judging a performance sport, a performance event, like um, figure skating, for example, or dressage. And I learned about dressage when Mitt Romney ran for president, because he had a horse that did dressage, and I was like, what the hell is that? And But it turns out dressage is horse ballet, I kid you not, it's like horse dancing. It's an actual Olympic sport, I think. I guess they have points, but horse dancing. I mean, I guess Mitt Romney did because he had one of those horses. Just like most Americans do. Now, so there are degrees of support. And just like judging, say, figure skating or dressage, there's not like objective you know, mathematical formulas that you use to assess that. You have a set of standards, you apply them, hopefully, and you kind of get it right. And there's room for disagreement. Inductive arguments run into the same problem. That you have you know, objective standards, but how they apply can be debated. There's also then the question of measuring the strength. And people can, in good faith, honest, conscientious people can disagree about how good an inductive argument is. You know, that's perfectly you know, possible and legitimate. Now there's also the question of how strong is strong? You know, how good does it have to be before you say that's strong? Now, basically there's practical answers to this. One is professions set standards. So for example, in um, social science research, research with surveys and polls, kind of the gold standard is 95% strength confidence, which means that if you did 100 arguments like that, 95 of them would get it right. Also in journalism, kind of the you know, gold standard is also 95%. If you did 100 surveys like that, 95 of them would get it right. And the reason why it's 95 and not like higher is because it gets, if you're doing things like surveys or polls, it takes so much more to get a tiny increase. And of course, it's really, it's not, it's impossible to get to 100, so 95 is considered the you know, professional standard. Now, Outside of the professional standards, like if you're doing you know, research with control of cause to effect experiments, again, you'd, you'd want to hit like 95% certainty, that you're 95% sure. Now, as a practical matter in real life, it's like judging, to use another analogy, it's like how strong does a bridge have to be before you drive over to run over it? Or to use a main metaphor, um, one that's popular in Maine is ice fishing, where you wait for the lakes to freeze, and you go out and drill a hole in the ice and put a trap, which is basically like a fishing pole, like an automatic fishing pole, essentially. And you sit around with the ice all day, waiting for the fish. It's as fun as you as it sounds, which is why a lot of people drink <laughs> when they do that, because, you know, you're sitting on the ice all day. But it's, you know, kind of quiet and calm, and as I said, a lot of people drink when they, when they do that. So the question would be, before you go down the ice, how strong does it have to be? And different people have different you know, requirements. I mean, the minimal one is, it's gonna be at least enough so you know, when you step on it, you don't go, go through and drown. But then other people, you know, they want more and more margin of safety. And so metaphorically speaking, it, how strong does your inductive argument be, have to be? Well, again, it's like the metaphor with the ice or the bridge. It depends on how confident you are, or what your what your purposes are, how you know how much it would cost to be wrong. So, if you're stepping out on the ice and you're really close to shore and you fall through and your feet wet, uh, you know, unless you're like way away from civilization, then no big deal. You just come back in your car and drive away. If you're driving like your truck out on the ice, your brand new truck, then you probably want to have a lot more confidence. 
And yeah, there are people who test the ice by driving their truck on it, which is why there's businesses in Maine that specialize in pulling, pulling vehicles out of, out of lakes. And before that became law, you can be pretty sure that there's probably quite a few trucks in, way out in the lakes in, in Maine. Although now they're supposed to pull them out because of all the, all the contaminants and stuff. Now they won't pull them out. Yeah, yeah and it's, quite, and it's quite a sight to see something go through the ice like that, like a big truck. It's like, and you're like, Bob made a bad choice. We better, we better get Bob. <laughs> we better dig Bob out of the ice. I like my ice plenty thick because I don't like dye. So <laughs> I have a pretty good, pretty good safety margin. Learned that from my, my father. He's like, he's like, you know, ice fishing's fun, but dying is less fun. So <laughs> avoid the death thing. <laughs> now again, with inductive arguments, going back to that, how strong is how strong should it be? Well, again, it depends on, you know, what's at stake and what your tolerance for risk. So if you're using inductive reasoning, suppose like a couple of your friends recommend a new cereal. They say this is a really good breakfast cereal. You know, it's on sale now and it's pretty cheap. Um, yeah, I mean. Not a super strong argument. My friends like it, so I like it. Yeah, kind of okay. But if it's super cheap, it's worth it. If it's something like, you know, using some type of medication, you know, uh, then you probably want higher confidence in its, you know, in its effectiveness. So the more dangerous and costly it is, generally the more confidence you, you want. It's a matter of practical sense. Now, the next point of concern is Assessing the premises. Before we go in there, though, anything about valid, invalid, strong, or weak needs more stuff. This is pretty quick because, again, this entire course of script thinking logic devoted to just just this stuff. You can spend an entire semester just talking about arguments. Now, in addition to the quality of the logic, there's of course the quality of the content, the premises. And so the question to ask here is, are the premises true, or at the very least, plausible? More likely to be <clears throat> true than not true. So how do you tell? Well, basically, in the realm of critical thinking, there are three useful practical approaches. First one is this. Does the claim in the premise, does it match your own observations? In other words, what you observe, does it fit that? You know, have you seen it? If the answer is yes, plus in its favor. But of course, not guaranteed, because our observations can be wrong. Secondly, it would be a question about, does it match our background information? All the stuff we've picked up over the years. So for example, if a, um, if a premise claim that, uh, well, take an example. There's a claim that um, wearing copper, a copper bracelet can cure arthritis. But is there anything about like just wearing copper that would make you think that it would somehow heal like deep bone and tissue damage? No, I mean maybe it was like injecting copper or something and maybe the copper, you know, because actually we, we do need copper. Copper is actually, we don't need that much of it. And, but we, we do need some. There's like all these metals, all this weird amount of stuff. We need. we need iron, obviously, for our blood. There's other stuff we need. Some of it's you know, poisonous in large quantities, but if you don't gut it, you, you die. So if you have too much of it, you die. Mm -hmm. uh, so unlike money, you know, too little, you die. Too much, uh, you don't die. But money. Yeah, so in that case, we think, well, that's not very plausible. Now, of course, people's background information can be wrong. So not 100% guaranteed. Thirdly, it, we run the claim up against credible sources. Does it match them? And the source itself. If you get the claim from some other source, is the source itself credible? So kind of the usual things. You know, have I seen this? If the answer yeah, plus. Does it match my background information? Does it seem plausible? Plus. Does it match up with credible authorities in the matter? Does it come from a credible authority? Yes, plus. Now after all that, a claim could pass all those tests and still be wrong. Because people get things wrong, even the, the experts. And a claim may fail all those tests and turn out to be wrong for similar, similar reasons. But in general, 
if something passed the test, plausible. If it doesn't, implausible. Now, with deductive arguments, if you get an argument that is valid and all the premises are true, you get the perfect super platinum argument. It's as good as it gets. Because if it's valid, that means if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. If you put in all true premises, you get a true conclusion. So sound is as good as it gets. If there's a better argument, God kept it for himself. <laughs> because logically, we, there's nothing, nothing better. So sound means you know, those things. So valid plus all true premises. And then, of course, you get a true conclusion for, for free. Now, not surprisingly, over the centuries, philosophers have tried to, to build this. Because if you want to you know, be certain, the way to be absolutely certain is take a valid argument that you know is valid, and you put in things you know to be true. Because the outcome will be true, true with certainty. Our good dead friend Rene Descartes tried to do this. It's kind of the ultimate, one of the big philosophical projects. Now today they're doing a similar type of thing with big data. The idea being if you could create the perfect algorithms, basically valid ones that always give you true results, and you can just keep shoveling you know, true data into it, the idea would be is you would then get out all the, the answers. Now Descartes' project, of course, was to figure out you know, the nature of God, the universe, and everything. And of course the goal of big data is mostly to sell us crap. You know, crap politicians or shoes or whatever. So the purposes have changed. Uh, the methodology though remains the same. Solving mysteries of philosophy to sell people crap. But there's not a lot of money in philosophy. It's like, but there is a lot of money in selling people crap. So crap ideas and stuff. So there you go. Although there are people who do who have monetized philosophies, uh, Diogenes, um, People said to him, if you're so smart, why aren't you rich? So he went out and became super rich, and then went back to, I guess, living in this barrel. And there are people on YouTube, philosophers, who are trying to monetize their philosophy, which always makes you feel a little uncomfortable. It's weird to see someone you know, talking about all these philosophical ideas and like railing against capitalism, and then sell, trying to sell people like, like crap. I'm like, mm, I understand you gotta you know, put food in your tummy, but <laughs> that seems a little weird. This episode brought to you by cake. It's not a lot. <laughs> or is it? Now, with inductive arguments, the best one is what's called cogent. And that means that it's strong and it's got all true premises. Now, with the sound argument, you know for sure the conclusion is true, 100%. With a cogent argument, your conclusion could still be wrong because of induction. Now, validity is something, and strength, are something that are, you know, don't change. Validity is eternal. If an argument is valid, it was valid before the beginning of time, and shall be valid after the end of time. Which doesn't even make any sense, but there you go. Soundness, though, can vary from day to day, moment to moment. For example, my Wednesday argument is always valid, every day of the week. But it's only sound on Wednesday, because only Wednesday is Wednesday. So arguments could be valid. If they're valid, they're always valid. If they're sound, they may be sound one moment, not sound the next. Before pre pressing on, anything about this stuff needs more talk. So because they're all inductive, whether it's Copeman or, or whatever, it could come out with false conclusions. Yes, no matter how good, one of the, the sort of the curse or problem of induction is, no matter how good an inductive argument is, it, is, it can never be 100% certain. So no matter how true the premises are, no matter how strong the inductive reasoning is, the conclusion could still be false. So in in inductive, you're talking about probability. Yes. Deductive is certainty. certainty. Yeah, induction has basically one said If an argument is valid and your premises are true, your conclusion has a 100% chance of being true. With a inductive argument, 
all your premises could be true, and the probability of your conclusion being true will always be less than 100. Because you could, inductive arguments by their very nature, you can always be, be wrong. But that's life, <laughs> pretty much. Now there is, we'll actually, we'll actually look at this in, in the future, there is the question of, is induction merely due to our ignorance that we just don't know? So we, we're, we could be wrong because we don't know, or does reality really work inductively, where there really is probability such that you could always be wrong because things, you know, because of the way probability works. And it's kind of an interesting question. Namely, you know, is reality probabilistic? Can, did things happen by chance? Or are things all pre, pre-set or pre, pre-controlled? Which is a metaphysical, you know, metaphysical question. So maybe that induction is just our ignorance. We don't know how the universe works. So if the universe is determined, then everything that happens must happen. Well, it can't, can't be otherwise. Deductive arguments. Now, as we saw, their definition you know, is as we saw, specifically that deductive argument is such that it says to you that it promises that if all the premises were true, that the conclusion must be true. And if it keeps that promise, it's valid. If it breaks it, it's invalid. Deductive arguments also, as we saw, their hallmark is certainty and aversion to risk. Because with a deductive argument, your conclusion is deduced, extracted, distilled from the premises. There's no loop, which is why you can be 100%, you know, if you have a valid argument with two premises, you can be 100% certain. Now, their use is, of course, in cases when you want certainty. Well, we pretty much always want that. And then the question becomes, is it a case when we can use deduction? In some cases, we can, but a lot of cases, we cannot. You may wonder, like, why don't we always just use deduction? Why would we ever use something that's not 100%? And the answer is because, as we'll see, most of life is inductive. We can't get you know, 100%. 100% how do you tell when they're good or bad? Well, as I mentioned, the assessment is done through truth tables, and diagrams, proofs, none of which we'll look at, because that's like an entire course in and of itself. And as we saw, they can be valid or invalid, sound or unsound. That's their deal. Now, there's potentially infinite number of deductive arguments. And, but there are some that are so common and so, so old that they have their own little special names. We've seen this one. It's known as modus ponens, more commonly or known by its English name, affirming the antecedent, because this is the antecedent that is the consequent. Here's it being affirmed. And like the Wednesday example I gave, it looks like this. It's a modus ponens. There's its cousin, modus tollens, which is also about if P the Q, not Q, not P. For example, if a person um, gets a F, then they fail a class. The person didn't fail, they didn't get an F. And so anything you, put, you plug in there, if this is true and this is true, that will always be true. It's also known as denying the consequent. There's also the classic um, hypothetical syllogism. If P then Q, if Q then R, if P then R. Like, if today is Wednesday, then tomorrow is Thursday. If tomorrow is Thursday, the next day is Friday. So if today is Wednesday, then the next day after is Friday. And most phones again, because I'm wide headed for Now, one method will. Hmm? Oh, it says twice. To, you know, make any stuff, so perfect square. 
Otherwise, you'll get asymmetrical. That'd be terrible. Now, one fairly useful method, because one question is like, well, how do you actually like do metaphysical stuff? Because you don't get like a lab where you can put like you know things into test tubes and set things on fire. And it's done pretty much through thought experiments and logic. Now, one very useful tool in philosophy in general, in metaphysics in particular, is the reductio ad absurdum, or reducing to absurdity. And there are two modes of this. And they're kind of nerd cool, kind of the same way that running like Linux on your computer is kind of cool. Even cooler running on like your you know, thermostat or something. But anyways. So version one is this. Suppose you want to disprove something. Well, with the reductio, you assume what you're trying to disprove is absurd. true. And then you show that that assumption is absurd. Therefore, it must be false. Or you can do the opposite. If you want to prove something's true, you assume it's not true, show that's absurd, and conclude it must be true. For example. Can you repeat those again? Oh, sure. Version one is you want to show something's not false. So you assume it's true, show that assuming it's true leads to an absurdity or impossibility, <coughs> so you conclude that it must be false. The opposite approach is if you want to prove something with a reductio, you assume it's not true, you assume it's false, show that leads to an absurdity, so it must be true. For example, uh, centuries ago when I was in grad school, we were talking about, we were doing you know, uh, social and political philosophy, and we were debating a definition of oppression in class. And someone said, well, oppression is the mistreatment of a numerical um, minority by a numerical majority, which seems initially kind of appealing, because many forms of oppression involve you know, majority, minority, mistreatment. However, it's pretty easy to reduce that to absurdity pretty quickly. How so? Well, the easy way is this. In terms of percentages, are there more men or women? Women. 51%. More men are born, more males are born, but let's make it. If you've seen Jackass 1, 2, and 3D, you'll see why that's the case. Sometimes involving shopping carts and rockets. Uh, so they start off with more males, but kind of we thin the herd ourselves with rockets and shopping carts. So women are a majority. Therefore women can never be oppressed because they are a majority. But that's clearly not yeah, the case. You can also use the example of apartheid in South Africa. It was a white minority oppressing a black majority. And so in that case you would just say, well it wasn't oppression, but pretty clearly it was. And so the key hallmark of oppression, we'd say, is not who's got the most numbers, but a matter of, of treatment. You know, it often is majority minority, but it could be the, the, the opposite. But it's, you wouldn't say, well, I guess it's not oppression. Uh, you'd say, yeah, it's oppression. It's just you know, kind of unusual. Uh, or actually, actually, it is pretty useful. Gender oppression is pretty common. Now, it's a pretty useful method. We'll see more of it in the future. So that's deduction. Now again, there are entire courses, uh, logic, devoted to deduction, and so we've jammed like an entire semester <laughs> into like a couple slides, so clearly not complete. Before heading in our remaining minutes to induction, anything about the deductive that needs more D or duck? Logic for ducks. Inductive arguments. Inductive arguments are the ones we typically use. We use them all every day in real life because otherwise we'd be dead. Now, as I mentioned, the hallmark of induction is this inductive loop. You're taking what you've observed or know and you're leaping beyond your conclusion. Now, on the plus side, you can leap from what you've observed to what you haven't observed, be it like the future or you know, surveying populations, etc. The problem, though, is this problem of induction. No matter how careful you are in building an inductive argument, there's always a gap between your evidence and your conclusion, by, by definition, just the way they work. Because if there is no gap, it's deductive. You said that um, no matter how close you are to that. 
oh, no matter how uh, careful you are in your logic, there's always going to be a gap between your premises and your conclusion, where you're always making yeah, there's no there's no leap. It's not inductive. If there is, if it is inductive, there's a, a leap. Now the problem of induction was presented by our good dead friend David Hume, although he didn't call it that. But he noted that we can never achieve certainty with inductive reasoning, which is true. Now one of them might say, well, we can never be certain. On the other hand, we can say, well, yeah, that's just just how it is. You can't be certain. You just have to kind of play. The odds. Now, the assessment of inductive arguments, as I mentioned, is more subjective. You have a set of standards, you apply them, so it's more like grading a paper than assessing a, you know, like a mathematical equation. Because you have, you've got some standards, but it's not perfectly objective. And as we saw, they are strong or Now, one very useful analog or inductive argument for use in metaphysics, actually anywhere, if you can only have like one argument to use, uh, this is probably a bit. Of course, you can have as many as you want, but if you were restricted to one. Now, when you're engaged in an analogy, what are you doing? Oh, if you're making an analogy, what are you doing? Yeah, you're comparing stuff. Now, when we use analogies, there's a variety of purposes we have in mind. One common use is a uh, explanatory analogy. The idea there is you're taking something someone doesn't understand and taking something they do understand, comparing them, so the understanding transfers. So, for example, if you're trying to explain um, American football to someone from Europe, and they don't know American football, but they know about rugby and soccer. So you probably draw analogies between, you know, say it's, well, it's like soccer, because you're trying to get the ball across the field, but unlike soccer, you're allowed to like tackle people and hit people. Or, or you'd say it's like rugby, except you wear more equipment, so you actually do more, more damage, sort of. Uh, Ironically, it actually makes people more more dangerous. Kind of like boxing, uh, more like there are people in boxing gloves than, than not. And so we could use that to explain things. Now we also use analogies rhetorically, where we compare not to help people understand things, but to make them feel a certain way, positive or negative. So you might describe someone as being smart as Einstein, unless they're being ironic. They might use it to you know, be negative. Or I might say that someone is as um, you know, brave as a lion, or someone is as dumb as a brick. And the idea of the rhetorical analogy is to say that something is good or bad based on that comparison. It's not an argument in that case, it's just you know, trying to get people to feel a certain, certain way. Now our concern though here is with an argument by analogy where you are making an argument. And informally, the way it works is basically saying, well, these two things are like. What, what was trying to get people to feel a certain way? Oh, the uh, rhetorical analogy. Because the goal of rhetoric is to make people feel a certain way so they believe a certain way, whether it's true or not. Because rhetoric, it doesn't care whether it's true or false. The goal is just get people to believe it, whether it's true or false. In the case of philosophical argumentation, the goal is truth. So whether it's true or false does, does matter. So with an argument by analogy, the goal is to try to show that because two things are alike in certain ways, they're alike in this other way. And we'll pick up with that on the Friday, because time is once again. <laughs>